Kia ora. Kia ora, everybody. About there? Okay, is that too loud or can you understand me? Okay, so my message today is entitled Listening, Hearing and Doing or Obeying. So my vision of the Bible, New King James Version, only records one occurrence of the word listen in 1 Kings 20 verse 8 where the Hebrew word that it's translated from Shema is translated in English as listen. The word hear is used 516 times in the King James Version of the Bible and translated from the same Hebrew word Shema. So the word listen and hear uh, come from the same word. The word Shema means to hear intelligently and often implies to pay attention and obey. So to listen and to hear in the Bible means the same thing, to listen very carefully and to do what God has said. That is why it is so important we choose who and what we are going to listen to. The commentary in my Bible says, the greatest commandment of Scripture, according to Jesus, and the central confession of Judaism to this day is in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. These words are called the Shema. Moses was calling Israel to listen to God very carefully with the intention of obeying what he said. The following verses show almost a level of dedication that we might consider fanaticism, but this is in reality what is required for us as children of God to break through and succeed in our lives in Christ. So here it goes. This continues on from the first verse. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The name Shmuel, Samuel, of which two books of the Old Testament were named after, contains the verb Shema. His name means heard of God. After his mother Hannah asked God for a son, and he listened to her. And we know the story of how Hannah dedicated her son Samuel to God, and he served the priest Eli in the temple at Shiloh, and God called out to him three times while he was lying down to rest. And he listened, but he thought it was Eli calling him. When Eli realized it was God calling Samuel, he told him to go back. And when God called Samuel again to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And when God called Samuel the fourth time, that is exactly what he did. Not only is the word Shema translated in the Old Testament as listen and hear, but it is also translated as obey. Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6 says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So here the word Shema has been used twice, once for obey and once for indeed. We see that Moses was emphasizing what God was saying to the children of Israel. So in my words, I'm, I'm God speaking. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I've miraculously delivered you from them. Now you need to live by every word I tell you and you shall be blessed as a nation above all the earth. 
God was speaking to the Israelites there, but here in Revelation, he is talking about you and me. In verses one, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So how did we become kings and priests? By listening, hearing, and obeying God's voice. This is an explanation um, by a Christian author, Chris Nye. He said, This is the beauty of an ancient culture and the gift of the scriptures. The Jewish tradition, and particularly the Old Testament culture, did not differentiate between hearing and doing, or between listening and obeying. We came up with that. But God asks us to shema. God wants a heart where the listening is inextricably linked to the obeying. And this goes deeper than just a Hebrew word study. When he walked the earth, the Lord Jesus closed his most famous sermon with these words. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell and great was the fall of it. In Luke 9.35, it says, And a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. The Hebrew word, Ahava, which means love, and Shema are closely connected. God has expressed his love to us through his word, and in response instructs us to hear him. And show our love for him by doing what he tells us. In John 14, verse 15 and 17. Sorry, that's that scripture there. Um, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. So now we have the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth as we choose to continually listen to him. As we meditate on his word and pour out our praise to him and surround ourselves with his people, we become tuned in to hearing his voice so that we can obey it straight away. In Genesis, God created the heaven and the earth and everything in it by the word of his mouth. There was no argument from the word or the Holy Spirit. They were all in agreement in what God said came into being. Often we have to remove the noise and confusion around us before we can listen to what God is saying. There are so many messages being directed that we can have difficulty believing the right ones. Before I came to know Jesus, I spent a lot of time listening to music. One of my favourite places to listen to music was in my car because I had a good stereo system and I would crank the sound up. I can remember feeling energised by whatever I was listening to. And I even believed the music would help me be somebody just because I listened to the music. The heroes were the musicians that created whatever music it was. I'm not criticising the musicians because they were just fulfilling their callings. But really, the messages behind the songs were just rubbish. And I had no lasting peace in my life. 
I just chose to listen to whatever the particular God wanted to speak through that music. When I came to know Jesus, I initially struggled to find music that I could enjoy, but that wouldn't take me away, but that wouldn't take me away from following Jesus. My soul was used to being entertained. I now find that I am not fussed about listening to music, but it serves a different purpose to me now. Instead of being entertained by it, I find especially with worship songs that it is a portal where I'm ushered into God's presence and I'm hearing his voice. I'm sure you can all identify with this, but if you don't and you are struggling to hear and to listen to God so that you can do what he says, find even just one song that you like and play it over and over. That's one worship song. Um, and let the words sink deep into your spirit and you will end up doing what God directs you to do through your worship and if you sing along then you're hearing God's voice through your own voice we were created in his image and so we should do the things he does speak his truths and his promises hear them as we speak them and do them 2 Corinthians chapter 1 um, and I've discovered recently the easy English Bible. Christ says yes to all God's promises so that they become true. So when we pray, we say yes, amen, because we know that Christ has done it. And when we do that, we are saying that God is great. You and I have the advantage over the Israelites in the Old Testament in that we have the Holy Spirit living within us. We need to cultivate our hearing so that when we hear the Holy Spirit's promptings, we shema, we hear and do what he tells us. Lord, I pray today our hearts will be set to hear your voice, that we would apply what you say without hesitation, knowing that you are totally reliable because your word is truth and you cannot lie. Empower us through your word and by your spirit today, Lord, to be the answer to our lost family members and friends. Thank you, and I'll now pass it on to my lovely wife, Jeanette. Awesome. Um, thanks for that great teaching, babe. Um, now you've heard the facts, and we're into the feelies. Life is hard. Don't worry, babe. I promise it's not all doom and gloom. But sometimes life can be hard. When there are so many demands on our time, our finances, our relationships, our patience, our efforts, it can feel like we're being torn in every different direction, giving out of our lack internally until we feel completely emptied. We can overcommit and give and give until we've got nothing left of ourselves to give. Our children, Marcus and um, my children, are a blessing from God. And in most part, they are. They are busy teenagers and require a lot from us at this time. They can empty every facet of our being. Our time, our energy, our bank account, and our emotions. When it comes to our children, I wear my heart on my sleeve. And in bringing them up, I know I've made more mistakes than I wish to recount, but thankfully, God loves them more than I do and has held them up in his hands. I actually love my kids so much that sometimes it hurts. I'm so invested in them, and I want them to be beautiful, well-mannered, God-filled contributors to society that I sometimes forget that they have to start forging their own way in life, whatever that is going to look like for them and their own relationship with Jesus. Our teenagers have their own big opinions and are quite happy to share them, even when they are in complete contradiction to ours. And then it all becomes about the win instead of the relationship. And then all knowledge and understanding that was there a minute ago has gone out the door and I am operating in the human spirit instead of the Holy Spirit. But the consequences of this is always damaging. All the knowledge that I've learned in parenting, and I'm still learning, is great, as to is understanding what to do with that knowledge. 
but without the application of the knowledge, I can remain in the same place, making the same dumb choices I made the last 17 times and getting the same outcome I didn't want to begin with. I know, but I just have not applied what I know. But that's not all. Then I lament about my own bad behaviour and my bad choices, become guilt-ridden because my children are so important to me, and then my joy disappears and the weight of not holding my tongue, like Marcus can do so well, and my choices overwhelm me. In my human strength, I lack completely. There are seasons that I have operated behind a facade, even though I have been saved and planted in an awesome spirit-filled church where I hear amazing life-giving messages and I know the truth of God's word and have knowledge of what I should do, if I'm not applying what I know, I end up in an abyss of darkness, pretty much drowning in an emptiness I have created by not including the one who knows me best, God. The devil is clever and he will use the very things we treasure most and in my case, it's relationships. In our vulnerability, or human inability, he tries to make what we are feeling totally out of context and become bigger than what we know to be true. I'm sure I'm not the only one that has been there. But the beauty of all of it is revealed in Acts 3.19, and I'm going to read from the Amplified Classic Version. So repent, change your mind and purpose. Turn around and return to God, that your sins may be erased, blotted out, wiped clean, that times of refreshing, of recovering from the effects of heat, of reviving with fresh air, may come from the presence of the Lord. It is with the presence of the Lord that we are revived. Being in his presence is everything. When God's presence filled the temple, the priests could not perform their service because his glory was so overwhelming. And that's found in 2 Chronicles 5.14. God's character is too immense to even process in human terms. His glory is his essence. It is never changing, ever present, omnipotent majesty. The Lord just always is. We stumble. We fall. We get scraped along the sidewalk of life. Ours is always changing. But his presence is unchanging and ongoing, and we are always only a breath away from the God whose presence filled the temple. When I am far from God, when life becomes unnecessarily hard, when there is an emptiness I can't seem to fill, I know I have not been spending enough or any time bathing in his presence. I have made other things greater than my relationship with him, like my children, or my feelings, or my shortcomings, or even my busyness. I have forgotten where my help and my joy and my hope comes from, and also how much joy it brings to the Father to have me in his presence too. John 737b to 39a says, all you thirsty ones, come to me. Come to me and drink. Believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out from within you, flowing from your innermost being, just like the scripture says. Jesus was prophesying about the Holy Spirit that believers were being prepared to receive. Therefore, living water is a metaphor that depicts spiritual sustenance. At the core of this, Jesus is the living water and provides the spiritual nourishment for our souls to prosper. We have to immerse ourselves in the living water where we can not only be washed clean, but where we can get refreshed and revived, brought back to life. As the living water flows from Jesus to us, so then from us, living water flows out to others, and we become like streams of living water ourselves. We have the living water inside of us and God's word speaking on our behalf. Who wouldn't want to be in his presence? When I wake up in the morning and my mind is on him, I'm having a good day. But there are three ways I like to get into his presence quickly. I like to worship in song, to feel like I'm entering into his gates with thanksgiving 
and his courts with praise. I can tell him how much I love him through the lyrics and the music just helps to change up the atmosphere. Speaking in tongues is a powerful prayer gift given to us by Holy Spirit and we can express to God all the things we want to but may be unable to put into intelligible human words. God understands every utterance of the Holy Spirit. I speak in tongues when there is just too many things I need to say or I just don't know how to say them and when my emotions overwhelm me. He is right there in my midst, loving me like I am the only one. The third thing I love doing to beckon the presence of God is to start thanking him. Thanksgiving is so underrated. When you give thanks, it reminds you why you love God so much and how much he has done in your life. The blessings and miracles and answered prayers come to light. And I'm sure God, like the rest of us, likes to hear thank you now and again too. Sometimes the outer circumstances of our troubles don't look like they are changing much, but our hearts and mindsets are changing, and our inner man is being refreshed and renewed and given strength to stand up under the weight of whatever burden we bear. God's presence is a great place to be, even when everything is going along nicely too. My most wonderful memories of the power of being in God's presence were in my first few years as a Christian. I had a fabulous friend in our church. We were single, carefree, and totally in love with Jesus. On full moon nights, we would go down to the beach, invite Holy Spirit to invade, and for Jesus to walk and pray and laugh with us. Those times were powerful, and we saw a multitude of prayers answered and atmospheres changed, and our lives were filled with the abundance of joy. God was glorified in and through us. We were wading in the living waters, and living water flowed in and out of us. And then I got married and had kids. Nah. <laughs> uh, but suffice to say... When you step out of that living water and you allow disappointment, fear, trials, burdens, bitterness, or worry to take you away from the presence of God, it can have dire consequences. That God-loving and God-fearing beautiful friend of mine is at present not walking with Jesus. She has forgotten where her help and her joy and her hope come from. So, in those times when you move away from God, who is unchanging, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and allow life to move you and shake you and steal your peace and joy, just remember Acts 3.19. So repent. Change your mind and purpose. Turn around and return to God, that your sins may be erased, blotted out, wiped clean, that times of refreshing of recovering from the effects of heat, of reviving with fresh air, may come from the presence of the Lord. It's a wonderful place to be without worry and the joyful surrender of self in God's presence. When being in his presence becomes less about you and more about him, that is where his presence abounds. More of him, less of you. Amen. Amen.